The first thing that people must notice uh, when talking to you, my good man, is, uh, is the accent. You're not originally from London. Yeah. Where, uh, where was home once upon a time? I grew up in Glasgow in, in Scotland. And I've lived in London for about eight, eight or nine years. Um, yeah, I basically got drawn to London because of pirate radio. Um, people used to send me tapes, old jungle tapes in particular. When I got to London, I, start, I used to DJ jungle. When I got to London, I started playing UK Garage. And so I've always just followed that mutation of, of London-based hardcore continuum music. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say, I mean, you know, it was mentioned before, but this whole, I mean, you, you read it in a lot of blogs, this whole notion of, of the continuum, the new one. Can you explain a little bit further this, this, this whole notion? Yeah, I suppose, it, you know, it's, it's what happened when Acid House in the UK uh, collided with Afro-Caribbean, um, Afro-Caribbean music culture in London in particular. Um, so it's dub, reggae and dancehall. And when these collided, you got, in the early 90s, hardcore, and then, most importantly for me, jungle, 93, 94, drum and bass, UK garage, um, grime, and currently grime and dubstep. I mean, it's interesting to know, I mean, in the middle of the 90s, especially in the UK, I, th I think the whole jungle explosion took, so, so many people growing up, it just was, was all consuming, and... Uh, you know, for a lot of people, they, they got to a point where it was just like they kind of got fed up with this whole genre. At what point in time were you just like, I mean, obviously so, so deep into this music, and then you were just like, no, nah, this is what's happened here? Yeah, I mean, with Jungle, jungle and Drum and Bass, I was so immersed in it as a listener. Um, and music, like any drug, stops working at a certain point. And for me, it stopped working when I started realizing that without thinking about it, I was buying the same record. And it was taking my money for no reason. <laughs> um, so I suppose I completely lost control by that point. So that must have been about 97, 98. Um, and then I started hearing some of the early two-step stuff, um, the, the stuff of the big bass lines and the kind of reggae. You reggae more like the, the, the rip groove kind of... Yeah, I wasn't really into the Speed Garage thing. I've never been a huge fan of four, four music. So when, when the Speed Garage thing started to break up, rhythmically break up and become a little bit more intricate and jungle influenced, not just in the bass lines, but in the rhythms. So it's kind of the early Dem2 stuff. Yeah. Right, so I mean, obviously, you'd, you'd, you know, you'd spend a bit of time commuting from Glasgow to London to go to parties and what have you. But when you first moved there and were living there, I mean, what was London like for you? Pretty, pretty easy to all of a sudden get involved into music, or...? Um, it's pretty intense city. Um, yeah, I, I, my first involvement in music in London was I set up a website called Hyperdub, which later became my record label. And Hyperdub was, was a kind of web magazine um, where I quickly became a journalist um, and interviewed everyone all the producers that I was interested in from the last five, six years. So people like Lemon D and Dillinger, um, American hip-hop producers like LP, um, German dub, kind of electronic dub producers like Jan Jelinek, um, and then all the early dubstep producers, um, LB, Horsepower, but also people in UK Garage at the time, Miss Dynamite. Um, and we kind of followed that through right up to Dizzy Rascal, Wiley, and um, later, you know, 2003 or four. And then when we started the label in 2004, I didn't have any time, so I kind of trashed the website. I mean, was, was the website quite a bit of a focal point for, for people that are interested in, in this kind of in a new stem of, of base culture, if you will? Yeah, because I think it was kind of unique in the way it, brought all those kind of bass musics together. Um, and it was also the, really the, the main place to find out about um, that side of UK Garage, in, not just in that kind of press release style of interview, but in kind of quite in-depth interviews. Um, 
So it provided a bit of background that didn't exist in other media platforms at that point. Was there a bit of a focal point as well for, um, for the music? There was a record store called Big Apple in Croydon. Tell us yeah. about this place. Yeah, Croydon, Croydon was, is, is, I suppose, the, the home of, of, of dubstep. And Croydon's like a, for people that don't know, it's, a, it's a, like a small city right at the south, of, uh, right at the south part of, of London. And it's, it's kind of grim. Um, I've heard people describe it as the Detroit of, of England. I'm not sure that's accurate, mainly because I haven't been to Detroit, but it's, it's kind of grim, and um, you, I suppose you can hear that a little bit in, in how dark some of the music is. Um, but there was a record shop in, in Croydon called Big Apple, um, staffed by one of the main, one of the early dubstep DJs called DJ Hatcher. Um, and that shop... Uh, worked as a kind of hub for the music. Um, Horsepower were from Croydon as well. Benga and Scream, who are big um, producers in dubstep just now, but at the time were like 14, 15, 16. Um, and, and I suppose latterly, uh, probably the, 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 the core of the dubstep scene now revolves around... Um, a night called DMZ, and these producers called Digital, Mystics, Lofa, and Scream, and, and they're, again, from that, that kind of area of South London that's quite near, or just north of Croydon. We see someone else who, who came through a, a little bit later, but ended up on your label, uh, who's, there's an obvious, well, it seems like an obvious connection there, is Burial. Tell us a bit about Burial. Yeah, Burial was like a, a guy who kind of got in contact with me when I started the, the web magazine, because he was really into that side of UK Garage. And he's been, send, he's been sending me tunes for about five or six years, four or five years. And I put a 12-inch of his last year, kind of we just pressed up 500 and he sold quite quickly, so that was cool. And then um, he kept sending me stuff and his stuff kept getting better, so I was like, this clearly, the man should put an album. And so we put out the album around about May, and it's been quite, I mean, for that kind of music, it's been quite staggering, the feedback that we've had about it and how well it's sold. Yeah. Um, and it's, again, it doesn't really fit in anywhere. It's definitely a tangent from what dubstep is. Yeah. Um, but it, it sounds kind of vaguely reminiscent of particularly Paul mm. from Berlin. Um, but with a lot of UK garage syncopations and also quite dark and melancholy.